Welcome to the Great Lakes Fishing Podcast. We have one of our favorite guests, a guy that's been on the show several times, but it has been a while since we've had him on. It is Ron Winter. Ron, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Chris. You're you're one of the guys, one of the first guys to actually able to touch the lithium series. Uh, you did a lot of testing for us. We'll get into that in a little bit, but let's first talk about what you've been up to this spring. It, you sent me over a log. It looks like you've been spending some major time on the water. Tell me about your fishing adventures lately. Well, uh, one of my favorite spring activities is going to the Niagara Bar. And uh, I got a lot of testing, eight hours a day for six straight days. We got on the water. And, uh, you know, the fishing there, it was, you know, I, I started going again after being absent for four or five years because my kids were in spring sports. So last year was the first year I returned after missing four or five years. This year, again, these last two years, numbers of fish were put us in the top three for trips for the last 22, 23 years. So the fishing has been outstanding. Where are you going out of when you're fishing the bar? Or what port are you using? We go out of the Niagara River in Youngstown, right next to the Coast Guard Station. There's a twin ramp. And uh, we start at 5 in the morning to get a jump on the other boats that are coming out. And uh, we're, you know, we're basically fishing from the bar over to the fence and back to Wilson. And we find, you know, where, they're, where the fish are hanging out and stuff. And uh, during the lock derby, uh, during the 10-day lock derby, and uh, it really can drill it down quick. There's four or five boats that we all hang together and uh, share information. So are you going out there with the group or are you kind of hooking up with the guys when you get out there? Uh, I just go out with a friend uh, that's my childhood friend. that has been fishing with me for the last 17 years. And we have boats from Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Vermont, where I'm from, on Lake Champlain. And we all, most of us stay at these cabins. So we're all together and there's another guy that stays in Wilson and he's from New Hampshire. So we pool our data. We probably have seven or eight boats and uh, it makes it really easy to drill down, drill it down quick and find out, you know, what's going on. Uh, the interesting thing is uh, this with the warm weather this year, we're two or three weeks ahead of, you know, we had, as Bob Soggin said, we had temperatures 10 degrees warmer than we're used to seeing, which changed the strategy a little bit and made us, you know, fish, a little differently in terms of you know the location and stuff but uh you know there's still the fish are still there you know for first half of the derby for us yeah it's really interesting out there i was actually just out there a few weeks ago and when that flow comes in off the lake you can see the pronounced line in the water of, of yeah. where that flow is coming through and, and when you're fishing around that area you can you can feel the cold coming off of that water that's coming down the river off of Lake Erie, but with, with the temperatures we had this winter, you know, Lake Erie just never froze up like it did. So I'm sure that flow, even though it's cold, it's not as cold as it usually is. There's nothing as, as cold as an east wind at the bar. Uh, you know, we bring our, our propane heater, our Mr. Buddy, and you know, just like we're frostbite fishing, cause many mornings when we get that east wind, we'll uh, fire that thing up just to get the chill out of the, the cabin for the first three or four hours. So it really helps us, but I've never seen so much east wind that the six days we were out there fishing, the first six days of the derby. And uh, it really, you know, it, it makes it a little tougher, but there were days that we did really well and days, you know, we did okay, but uh, it still overall was really good bite for the six days. We landed like 70 kings and uh, lost a couple jumbo steelhead. And, uh, you know, it was uh, just a great bite. Yeah, great bite out there. So you've got these these groups of guys out there. You, you yep. know, you're running six, seven boats out there. What is uh, what's the evenings like when you guys get back on shore? And I'm sure there's uh, some pretty good dinners. Really good dinners. Uh, one thing we always do, we have a like a potluck dinner at one of the cabins, and we invite the guys, the seven or eight boats, even sometimes a few people extra. You know, because it's always nice to have extra company. You know, fishermen we might meet at the dock or something and say, hey, why don't you join us, you know, or somebody we met. And uh, it's it's really fun because we some of the guys bring walleye, striped bass. Uh, you know, we have all kinds of food. So we have a really nice uh, nice buffet there and when we all get together, the, the one particular night that we set aside. 
So with all that data and seven boats out there and you guys working together, what, what did you learn this year? What was something that, that you guys or that you picked up on personally that maybe you, you never noticed or didn't know before coming into this season? Well, dealing with the warmer water, uh, dealing with all the east wind, uh, you know, we would sometimes go out deeper, you know, to find the fish. And we, we, we don't normally go out to 200 feet of water. And I know early in the Derby, that was something that we, you know, something we different that we've never done before because we we're trying to, okay, we're two weeks later now. So the fish were starting to move a little bit and we had to actually go out to deeper water to find them. They weren't just sitting on the edge of the bar where we normally fish, fish for them. Now, some days they were early in the Derby. Other days, you know, we had to go look for them. So this was something we were unaccustomed to, but you know, having seven or eight boats and fishing in a derby, you can drill it down quick and save a lot of time. And this was something that, you know, we uh, were not accustomed to seeing. Hey, you guys ran onto the bar. Let's talk a little bit about fishing around uh, your home area. We've had you on before to talk about that frostbite fishing on Lake Champlain, but you've been out there this spring and I'm assuming you'll be out there a lot this summer as well. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, salmon fishing on Lake Champlain as we get into these these early summer months? Yeah, and, uh, you know, we're seeing uh, the pollen in the water, which it seems like it's two weeks early. The temperatures, I measured 67 degrees a couple days ago on the surface, but our temperature was 55 at 12 feet. So, you know, that top layer of water is very warm, but those fish are still up high. So that hasn't changed a whole lot. And... Uh, We've been getting great catches of landlocked salmon. They're not as big as the Pacific salmon. You know, they average 17 to 18 inches, and we sometimes get a, a 19 or 20 or 22 or 23, and a jumbo is 24, sometimes 25, 26 inches. Of course, that's what we're fishing for. But uh, the numbers of fish just in the last two years have uh, increased significantly. So, you know, we had, a, we had a down spell for four or five years, and we didn't know if it was the fleas you know, that came on, it was, or, you know, the obviously the cormants have always been a problem, but we've been noticing the last two years, our fishery making a strong comeback, which is, which is really good because for four or five years there, we were not even seeing the small fish, which were, there was a lot of questions about that, but we're now seeing the fish coming back in good numbers again. So that's bodes well for next year that these 17 to 18 inch fish that we catch that are a year and a half old will be the 23, 24 inch fish a year from now. Now, these are Atlantic, uh, landlocked Atlantic salmon you're fishing for out there. Uh, tell me about your spread. What, what kind of spread are you running? What does it look like? How are you deploying your lines? Well, two downriggers. And uh, we, we'll put, you know, well, we, when we started early in February and March, we're just running small inline boards. And uh, there's two or three of us. We'll run four inline boards and two downriggers set, you know, two or three feet and run our lines 100 feet back with a little, uh, three inch two and a half inch uh small stick baits my by made by missouri and uh we uh will put them out back 80 to 120 feet on each and we'll fish in about you know eight to ten to 15 20 25 feet of water and there is one area that we do really well it's uh Wayland's bay that's in the down in the southern south of us about 45 minutes from where i live and the salmon seem to show up there first in february the water's 35 degrees, and uh, we have some great fishing, you know, for those those fish, and we occasionally we get a few bigger ones. But mostly it uh, starts out with stick baits, a couple split shot, back 100, and out on our, our small inline boards, and a couple on the rigger just, you know, there's only two rods per person, unlike the Great Lakes. So, you know, we don't have a, we can't put out a lot of lines, especially if there's just two of us in the boat. We're just doing two riggers and two inline boards, and sometimes I have three people. So that's primarily, you know, small baits, two and a half, three inches, spoons. Some guys do well too. But later on, we switch over to spoons once the water warms up above 40. And we'll pick our speed up to two, six, two, seven, instead of two, two, three, two, four, you know, in February and March and April. Once that water crosses the 40 degree mark, we start picking up our speed and we switch over to spoons. So one to two color lead is segmented lead is very popular on inline boards. And we'll set the drag just light enough so you don't you just have to listen for the drag to go off and know you got bit. So that's that's a great cue. 
And uh, so I, mean, I think lead core is the best weapon for us early like this when we're fishing in, in the winter and up until, you know, middle of April. And then we're, you know, we're going to, well, we're still using two colors of lead right now. So because they're only, fish are only down 12 feet. And the riggers we put at 16 feet the other day, and the fish hawk tells us they're running at 13 feet, you know, the X4D Ultima. So, uh, yeah. So as you get into July, where will those lines be running? I mean, how deep do you need to go as, as that water temperature really warms up on top? Sure. Uh, you know, we start seeing the thermokine develop middle of June, you know, Father's Day weekend, 20, 25 feet, 30 feet, depending how hot it, it gets, you know, with heat waves and stuff. And then into July. So we'll switch over from running inline boards because you obviously have to put more color out to get out to those depths. And we'll switch to light bite slide divers. That's our, our weapon of choice and very effective. You only need two of them. You don't have to put out a bunch of lead cord lines and stuff and, and downriggers. So using the uh, light bite slide divers till right through till Christmas, that's that's our that's what we typically use. And, we, and if we have three people in the boat, we'll put out four diver rods, these four light bites. And our two riggers. So we can go as deep as 50, 60 feet, you know, where the temperature is. And we look for on our fish hawk, uh, 61, 62 degrees. That's our benchmark. If once we, we establish that, every, we want, we fish the top line at that probe on my rigger. And then the rest of the stuff, five or 10 feet below that. So that's how we typically approach it. Do you find these fish are a little spookier than what you're running into on Lake Ontario? I mean, you're kind of running a small spread. And I know that a lot of that is just because of your regulation with only two rods. But mm -hmm. where do you, what do you feel like the, how the fish react to boat traffic out there? Well, boat traffic will shut them down, most certainly. You know, you get more than two or three boats working a, a small area and it'll shut it down real quickly. But uh, it's an interesting question because we're... Landlocked salmon, there are some schools of thought that the more lures you can compress into a small area, it, it, it resembles a school of bait. And some guys will put down vertical attractors. We've done it at times to add to that nuance. And, you know, we'll use fixed add lines. We call them cheaters here, but they're, you know, extra, you allowed one extra line. So we'll, we'll put that on a fixed slider up about three or four or five feet and create this bait ball effect and it can be very effective on landlocks but on the other hand uh using our light bite slide divers i think we i think we catch 70 80 percent of our bigger fish come off the light bite slide diver so you're getting away from that all that noise and cannonballs close to the boat like the pacific salmon and the, the light bite slide divers who are way away from the boat and out will tend to catch our bigger fish so that's that's why we like them so much we talked a little bit about boat traffic. I know uh, Lake Champlain is a really, really popular vacation destination for your neck of the woods. W what is the wreck boat traffic like out there when you get into the summer? I'm sure that's something you don't have to deal with when you're out there in January. No, it's just us fishermen. Usually there's about three or four boats out in January and December, and February and March. Sometimes there's a half a dozen and uh, that's not an issue, but you know, we'll see a fair amount of sailboats in the summertime and, and a lot of wreck boats in, in certain areas. And, you know, it's mostly weekend traffic. So, uh, you know, I'm lucky I get to fish during the week, so I avoid the weekend traffic. But uh, it, it can be problematic at times, you know, fishing on the weekends and in some of those areas where there's a lot of traffic. But, you know, us as fishermen, we get out early. So a lot of times that traffic doesn't start till 10 o'clock, people waking up and coming out on the lake. So a lot of times, you know, we're going in at 10 o'clock if we do choose to fish a weekend and it's a nice day. Ron, uh, you talked a little bit early on about going out to Niagara. I know you like to make a summer trip once in a while. What uh, Do you have any other destination trips on your list for this year? Uh, Oak Orchard. It's going to be our third trip in the last three years. And this is a July 17th time frame for six days. And I can't wait because uh, that summer fishery and the reason we pick the third week of July, because we all know about the wind and the waves. And I tell you, August has been horrible for wind for the past, I don't know, five or seven years for people going out there. But the, the winds are tend to be a lot lighter that third week of July. And that's our favorite time to go to Oak Orchard. 
and uh, we certainly take advantage of that. And when you have light wind, you have stable, you have stable fishery. You know the kings are around, steelhead are around, and uh, you know we're going out to four or five hundred feet last year and catching all our fish and trolling in a northwest direction against that current. And last and two years ago, we were in a hundred feet of water. You know, banging a left out of Oak Orchard and just following the shoreline. That's something that Bob Songen talks about a lot. And the fish were right there, too. And at that same time, our buddy's out in 250 feet, uh, nailing them with the flasher flies uh, three years ago when, when we were in 100 feet of water. So there's a lot of room out there. Uh, it's, it's not like the combat fishing that we see at the bar in the spring uh, or, uh, or in Mexico or Little Salmon River in late August. And uh, there's a lot of room for everybody. I think that's why the guys share so much information coming out of there. You know, Bob Songan and, and Hajeki and those guys, because they know there's a lot of room. It isn't everybody fishing one spot. Yeah, you've brought up Captain Bob Songan a couple times and just yeah. brought up Captain Rick, Rick Hajeki. And those guys are always doing reports and sharing information. And how much of that... I, I know you're a guy who loves data I and mean, that's why we're happy on the show today. We're going to talk about data in, in just yep. a little bit, but like they allow you to keep your finger on the pulse of some of these fisheries while you're still in Vermont. How much are you really keeping track of what they're saying throughout the year? I think a lot of people are, you know, um, they give some incredible, and anybody I introduce those links to and say, Hey, you know, you got to I send them, you know, in a text or email, and they're like, oh, my God, look what these guys are sharing. If it is just off the charts, it's it's very drilled down information and uh, it's very specific and it isn't long winded. And, you know, it isn't like, well, we're using this lure, this lure, this lure, this lure, this lure, you know, and this flash or fly and all that. You kind of fall asleep when you when you hear that those kind of reports. They get very detailed information and it helps me. You know, they use the buoy information before they even go out in the morning. They look at see what the temperature is down 60 feet whether they're going to go offshore or they're going to stay in close. It saves them a ton of time. And they share this information. You know, the, these guys are amazing. I mean, the, the, and as a data-driven person that I am, uh, uh, this, is just, this is just awesome information. Well, let's get into some of the data I wanted to talk about. And people have been asking us since we came out with the lithium series at Fishhawk, how long does these things really last? And um, you know, you've been one of the original testers of this product and you've been putting together some charts for this season on how long it lasts. You, uh, you pulled your probe off the charger with full charge on April 1st. Yes. And since then, you've been able to log a lot of time on the water. And we promised 50 hours of fishing on a single charge, but we do that for a reason, saying that that'll basically give the average guy a weekend of fishing pretty easily. Um, but what you've been finding out in your studies is it's a lot more than that. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what you found out this spring, starting with pulling your, your probe off the charger on April 1st. Okay, well, yeah, we that was the unofficial start of spring for us by charging that up. And uh, we want to start with a full charge. And we had 16 trips till May 21st, averaging almost seven hours a trip uh, fishing. And uh, we did have three weeks of downtime that we weren't fishing, but I thought for sure I was gonna have to charge this when I was at the bar, because I went to the bar, we had 42 hours on it. I thought, okay, I went the whole six days and 47 and a half hours, and we still had charge to come back and keep testing on Lake Champlain when we returned. I was, I was stunned. And uh, so looking at my data now, uh, all right, three more trips, eight hours, six and a half hours. And at the four and a half hour mark on May 21st, two days ago, I got the low battery signal and that uh, ended it at 107 hours. And what I thought was really interesting, you know, we've been using Fish Hawk forever and the batteries, you know, the tri four trip AA batteries. I think, although we never, you know, analyze that data on the how long the battery life is, it's kind of a ballpark. I think that lithium is on par with the batteries, which is just amazing. And, and, and I, you know, I, I heard in the beginning about the promise of the 50 hour life. So I was wanted to challenge that. And, uh, you know, I hear guys saying, yep, I, I fished a double charter today and I, you know, initially, and we charged it up. So the next day we have charge and I'm thinking to myself, Hmm, 
we just did 16 trips, uh, 107 hours straight, and so we had to charge it. And here's the best part. I bring the charger out, and I mean, here's the here's the little charging stand. I bring it out in the boat. The thing dies two hours into the trip. It's almost like your gas grill running out, right, Chris? You're like, ah, oh, you know, I'm going to have to pull out my backup one with the batteries, you know, and put them in. Damn. Well, I just plug the USB in, so my port on the uh, – for 20 minutes, I have that thing sitting there charging. Pull it off. I'm good for the next three, four hours. And that's that's pretty cool. That was pretty easy. You know, I lost 20 minutes of time. Now, yeah, but a, a hundred, 107 hours you put on that thing between yeah. charges. I mean, that's pretty incredible. And I think yeah. what it tells us is if the average guy is going to go out and do a weekend of fishing, you're going to be just fine. You know, come home, pop it on the charger on a Monday, and then the next weekend – you're ready to rock. Um, you've done some other testing for us too. Uh, last year, you, yeah. you put one on the bottom of the lake, and uh, <laughs> you, you did some good good data collecting for us, though, because you kept driving over it just to see how long it lasts. And uh, you know that was what we will call continuous operation. So the probe never came up, and of course, it's water activated. So while yeah. it while it uh, rests on the bottom of the lake, it was continually working. Tell us about uh, the time you got, how much uh, yeah. power it, it threw out while it was at the bottom of the lake. Well, it came up and hit my rigger. My short stop didn't work. It was May 18th, 20th, a year ago. And for some reason, it didn't see it stop at the surface. And it came up and there was a kink in the cable. And I watched the whole weight in the probe go plunk in 42 feet of water. And I was like, oh. So, okay. So we, we marked the spot and we tried to dive for it later. And the water warmed up and we, there was too much silt and mud. We couldn't find it. But I went back the next two days. I knew it had 20, 22 hours on it. And, you know, we're adding 30 hours because I came back later in the 24-hour window. Next day, we came back the next day. There was a good bite there. And the water was probably 45 degrees at the bottom. And uh, second day, still running. The third day, I it was just too windy to, to go out fishing. But when I, by my calculations... After the second day, there was 92 hours on that probe, and it was just just so that's why I was kind of excited about doing this little study to determine the true life of this, knowing there was a minimum there was 92 hours on that probe on the bottom, and uh, and we did another study this winter where we started on November 13th, charged it up, and on March 18th it, it uh, stopped at 63 hours. Now this is like a winter study. We're in 35 degree water mostly. And I have to add, the probe sat for two months. We didn't fish. And that was from December 8th to February 8th when we resumed fishing because we had some kind of bad weather. So we didn't, we didn't fish all winter like we did the year before. So that thing sat for two months. And I still kept going on. I got geez, six or seven trips at it for a total of 10 trips. And it was like it died at 63 and a half hours at March 18th. So that was kind of a winter test, if you will which is kind of interesting because, you know, the water's 35 degrees, most of those tests that we went, and it sat for 10 months. So I basically had underwater's test, okay, where it sat on the bottom, a winter test, you know, for 62 hours, and it sat for two months, and this uh, spring test, which, uh, you know, we only had three weeks of downtime that the thing didn't, didn't uh, we didn't put it in the water. So uh, we actually were able to get a lot of data for this and, uh, the bottom thing was it really helped us because I was determined to get some data from that thing sitting on the bottom. Yeah, that was one thing. When when you put that on the bottom, there was only like five of these in existence. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> it was it was a little a little bit uh, stressful for us, but we went. You know what? We're going to get some good data from this. Ron's going to keep driving over it, and we'll we'll yeah. get it figured out. And. You know, people uh, often want to know how you become a, a product tester. And I think this was a pretty good uh, example and should let people know what you need to do to be a product tester because you, you get great data and, and you put our products through, through things that uh, most people will never do. So we, we appreciate that. Well, I'm really thankful for Trevor because when I started testing for him back in 2012, I told him about this, these crazy people in Vermont that fish all winter. And he's like, perfect. Because we didn't have to wait till spring <laughs> to test his products. Right. If it can survive Ron Winter, it can survive anyone. So this was like the perfect uh, experiment for Trevor. <laughs> to right. have crazy people out there fishing all winter, testing his products. 
<laughs> well, the other thing great about Ron is he has a YouTube channel. You can go there and kind of keep track of all of his adventures and what he's doing on the water. And it's a lot of kind of no frill stuff. But if you want to see people catching fish and, and see some of these Atlantics he's pulling in and see what he's doing out on the Niagara Bar, it, it's a great YouTube channel to go to. Uh, tell folks how they can find you on YouTube, Ron. Well, if you type in my name, Ronald Winter, and put fishing or, you know, any, anything with that tag on it, my name, you'll, one of my videos will pop up and you'll see my channel and you can, you can log on. I also, if you go to fishing videos on Lake Ontario United, and uh, that's a great, I post some of my videos there. And my bar trip is there all six days. I usually get done, put, I, I, log i put them on the night uh, every night that i'm out there fishing by seven or eight o'clock it's uploaded to youtube and i actually post them there so people can see almost in real time how we did for the day now these videos are very short they're about a minute minute and a half because i like to keep them short so people don't get bored you're not seeing seeing somebody sitting there reeling you know or looking at their backs because i use gopro cameras you know off the downriggers and stuff and a hat and we were use music to make it a little more tolerable and we're just landing fish that's all and releasing them we return all our fish and uh, these make just good you know action videos and they're short in nature so that you can see the kind of fish that we're catching and uh just so it's just a just a fun hobby you know very cool anything i didn't ask you about today ron that you wanted to bring up sure sure chris one of the things that people ask me and you you, you know this and and trevor is uh, a lot of fishermen when they talk about the ultra and is 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 it compatible with their current fish hawk they want to know if that probe is compatible and i say absolutely and uh you know the fact that you can charge this up and not have to change batteries and it's so lightweight you can carry it on your downrigger without that heavy thing banging around it's it's, it's very lightweight in nature right there and uh the other thing is i love analytics and fishing is as really salmon fishing has really become a game of analytics in a way that we take this data and it actually helps us by benchmarking and looking at the different you know by setting our baits up in the water based on that true depth of where they're running not the blowback and not where we see them on the sonar because that's not where they are and using temperature and speed with fish hawk helps us set that baseline and helps us be better fishermen so that's what i wanted to end it with is you know, it, it's it's really driven by analytics, and I, I just love data and analytics, Chris. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Ryan. And that's a question that we feel like we keep saying and telling people that all this stuff is backwards compatible, um, but it's still a question we continue to get. So, yeah, if you just want to get the probe and continue to use everything else yeah. you have in your boat, you can do that and, and get the power of lithium, and all you need to do is, is get the probe. You don't need to get anything else, and it basically upgrades your system. But uh Ron, we really appreciate everything you do for us and, and all the work that you're doing, uh, helping us just making sure that the things we're saying are correct. And uh, if there's ever been a data-driven guy out there, it's you. And I, I think it's really cool and really important for people to know. I think a lot of people think, hey, I'm not a charter captain, so I'm not an expert. But uh, there's a lot of expert anglers out there that are not charter captains, and you're one of them. And thank we you. really appreciate having you around. Well, thank you for having me to, you know, spread the word to people and you know and what an advantage is to have these kind of tools in the in the toolbox and uh, somebody once asked me chris said like do you even have time to fish <laughs> you know when i'm doing these kind of doing these kind of things and i said oh yeah the fishing's like the background thing but i just love playing uh, in the toolbox and the you know in the sand pit if you will the, and uh playing with this stuff yeah, between collecting data and all the video stuff and fishing, you're probably a pretty darn busy guy in the boat. And again, we really appreciate you. He is Ron Winter, and uh, we will talk to you and see you on the next show. Thank you, Chris.